So let's go ahead and get started with the topic for today. So we're going to be doing something new and quite different from what we've been doing so far in the course, which is we're going to talk about data science ethics. And I want to acknowledge up front, instead of diving straight into this topic, that it is easy to have a dismissive attitude about ethics because you're going into a program with lots of challenging computer science ideas and statistical ideas that you're expected to learn. And it can be really tempting to think, well, I'm sure I can take care of this ethics thing just by being a decent person. Just don't do something awful. And I'm sure that's going to be fine. And what I want to persuade you of is that that isn't the case. Data science ethics is a challenging subject. It's often very subtle. And if you count on just relying on your intuition to keep away from engaging in harmful actions in your work as a data scientist, then you're going to be going into that battle without the tools that you need to be successful. So there are numerous cautionary tales along these lines that you'll learn about in Data 2080, and we'll talk about just a, a very narrow slice of that here. And I want to start out by talking about sort of at a high level, the kind of categories of topic that you can fit into a data science ethics course. And before we get into that, I want to tell you about a, a Prismia thing that I haven't used so far. It's actually not new, but I just haven't used it this summer. But we're going to do a, quite a few of these peer questions, which means that I'll ask you a question. I'll give you maybe a little more time to respond to sort of a discussion context. I want folks to have a chance to write you know, a, a good sentence or two to, to reflect on the question. But that means that some people will finish earlier than others. And as a solution to sort of keep you from experiencing that dead time while other people are typing, what will happen is that every time three people submit answers, those, those uh, three people will have a, a permutation applied to them and each person will get another person's answer. And that an answer that you will receive will be anonymous and you can respond to it. And uh, that person will, will get your feedback. So I'll ask a question, you answer it. Another person in the class also answers around the same time. You get their response and you can respond to them. So that just fosters a little bit of communication between the class without sort of taking you off on, on kind of side chats and stuff. So to, to frame this discussion around what are the topics that belong in a data science ethics course, let's start with the observation that when we do data science, we're doing it to have some kind of impact on the world. And of course, many of those impacts will be positive impacts, otherwise we wouldn't do it. So what are some examples of positive impact data science activities? So I see lots and lots of folks are participating, some good answers on the way, that's really great. So I shared a bunch of these. There are lots of good answers here. Some themes are helping to identify high risk events that might take place like uh, earthquakes or epidemics. These are things that you really want to, to be able to know about them in advance if you can. For example, you know we track weather closely enough that we can identify when really bad storms are coming, people prepare for those storms, and that's a lot better than getting caught off guard by them. So that, that's a good sort of category of positive applications. We have some more day-to-day -day ones, like just improving healthcare systems. So you might build data systems to help doctors get information they need to know about patients. You might use data science methods. You might use predictive modeling to try to flag something up with a physician and say, you know, based on these things that we're seeing in this patient's data, you might want to run this test or that test. So there's a lot of service area in healthcare for building better data systems using predictive modeling to enhance healthcare. So there's a couple people talking about chatbots here. So NLP for enterprise customer conversations, or oh, sorry, I mis misremembered. So that it was similar similar category, sort of customer relations, uh, either through chatbots or or identifying which customers you want to spend the most resources on helping to retain because they have the greatest probability of getting the most use out of your product. Yeah, and then a couple healthcare. So a lot of, a lot of similar trends. Here's a couple, couple more that came in. So these are some similar ideas here. Economic health, this is something that I think hadn't come up before, but if you study economic data, you can figure things out about how policies affect people's economic well-being. And there's certainly a lot of attention that goes 
in that direction and also positive uses of data science in the social sciences. So lots of good answers there. I'll list the ones that I have prepared as well. So facilitating scientific discovery when, when scientists are in the lab and they're doing things to, to uh, they're running experiments to try to figure out, does this have an effect or how does this mechanism work? They can use data science methods in many cases to facilitate that discovery, helping businesses prioritize and make decisions about how to best serve their clients. We saw some of those. And then deploying convenient technologies like recommendation engines, things like, you know, you watch Netflix movies and they recommend a movie that you actually really do want to watch and you watch it and enjoy it. That's a positive thing. Facial recognition technology or self-driving cars. So there was a little bit, I think someone mentioned self-driving cars as well up here. But in any case, lots of examples there. Maybe that point has been sufficiently belabored. So all of that to say, we do positive things as data scientists, but when you are affecting change on the world, there's always the responsibility to consider the negative consequences of the things that you're doing. So what are some examples of real world situations where people might use data to inform their decisions, but in doing so, they might have a negative impact on others? So this is really, really great. There's a lot of good examples here. So I'll, I'll start uh, sharing them. So personal information can become insecure when health data is used for statistical analysis. That's true. And the reason is, as Nick pointed out, anonymity is very difficult in many cases. So you might, we'll talk about this in a little bit, but you might want to anonymize some data and make it available for people to analyze, but then they might be able to de-anonymize that data. And that could be a privacy concern for the people whose data is in that data set. So that's an a important category. Uh, other folks also talking about privacy. So there's privacy and security concerns that are, that are being raised here. Here's another kind of class of examples. Banks might make decisions, for example, on who to lend money to or general business decisions that are made about who to transact with. And you might have gender or race come up in that context, even when people are taking some care to avoid that. So we'll talk about that, you know, sa same idea here, denial of loans based on data that are not related to the uh, person's financial stability. Uh, access to housing, we'll also talk about this. This is great. There's lots of threads sort of pointing towards some of the examples we're going to get into. I'd like to hear from someone. Yeah, so Yash had a pretty long answer and he has a check mark here. By the way, while Yash gets, gets ready to speak, if you click in the top left and again here, you can change your call on me preference. So I know some people had it set to don't call on me earlier, but if you, you know, today's discussion oriented class, it's definitely gonna be helpful if we have as many of these as possible. So if you're in a situation where you can't talk, that's fine. But if you, you know, just have it set on don't call on me because you haven't looked at it in a while, this is your chance to update that so I can call on more folks. But in any case, Yash, why don't you talk about your answer here? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's a great example. We'll explore some closely related examples to that in a little bit and kind of do a little bit of a deeper dive. Here's this, the ones that I have prepared. It's sort of a lot of similar themes. What's interesting is that I kind of underemphasized privacy and security in my list, whereas for the answers that came in from the class, that was kind of overrepresented. So that's a, a good compliment between the two. But in any case, there are a bunch of sort of fairness and equity type examples, these first few. So a bank uses data about a potential home buyer to determine whether to issue their loan or when you're hiring and you're using data on a, an applicant's application or you you know use some performance metrics to determine raises and maybe there's something unfair about those performance metrics companies often use demographic data to determine where to open a new store and this can have impact on the community for example if grocery stores shy away from a particular region they can be become hard to access healthy food in that region. There, there's sort of a different class here where you're, you're really building a, a technology, a data technology. So it's not so much about driving decision making as introducing a convenient tool. But nevertheless, if it's a data product, it could be built in a way that works better for one group of people than another. And obviously, you want to minimize that if you're the person that's building that technology. And there, there was an, a, another example that came up earlier about social media or like you know politicians studying the way that we interact online, there's a lot of data there and there's a lot of opportunity for people to exploit sort of hacks in human psychology to accomplish ends that 
are not really compatible with what we, we would be going for as individuals acting in that system. And then another one that came up earlier is economic models. So you want to use statistics to understand economic policy, but if you, depending on how you do that, you, you can imp negatively impact some people in the economy. Uh, that's something you have to consider. Just to kind of put some of these examples into boxes, I mean, it's a little artificial, but I think it's helpful to start building out kind of the top level of the outline of the topics that, that you're going to see in a day science ethics course. So there, there's a lot of concern about fairness or equity. The first several examples pertain to that. There are also important questions about transparency and interpretability. So if you have a model, is it easy to inspect what it's doing? And is it easy for the stakeholders involved to understand how that model is being used? What are its implications? That's maybe the, the example where there, there's sort of the tightest linkage with the details of a particular predictive model that you might use if you're doing some machine learning. And then also, as I mentioned, folks brought up on several occasions the privacy and security concerns that come with doing data science at scale or really just in general with technology and in fact i want to ask you a question about that so when we talk about privacy a lot of times we're talking about things like two-factor authentication like keep your account from being hacked that kind of stuff but data science and in, in particular building machine learning models does bring up some privacy concerns in a in a way that's pretty directly relevant and that's been alluded to a little bit already actually but what what would be an example of that? So this is, this is a great answer. So scraping web data without a user's consent. Uh, this is a different sort of category than I was thinking of. But yes, if you're doing data science, you might need to collect some data and you might be inclined to collect that data in a way that is not respecting the consent of the people whose data it is. Just share a couple other examples here. Yeah, this is sort of similar, similar category of ideas. And then this is the one that I had an example sort of similar to. So being able to use data science methods to identify a person based on some data that you have about them. And then of course you could use that information or someone could use that information in a way that's harmful to that person. So we mentioned this earlier because it came up in an, an answer that was shared from the class. But if you have your data included in a public data set that has identifying information stripped out of it, so that it can be used for statistical understanding without harming any of the individuals in the data set. It's not, not universally, but very often possible to de-anonymize that data. And then you know who, you know, you might know, for example, the health care information about a particular person in that data set. And that's violated that person's privacy. And of course, it can in, impact them in a negative way. This is kind of a broad class of topics, fairness and equity, transparency and interpretability, privacy and security. There are many ways that you could create a kind of top level outline for a data science ethics course. This is just one sort of suggestion of some broad themes that you see when you look across syllabi from data ethics courses in lots of different universities. But there are kind of some good categories to keep in mind for like, what even is data science ethics? These are good examples and high level headings to keep in mind. But we want to focus in this class, since it's just one class day and this could easily fill up a whole semester, we want to focus on one particular thing here, which is a pretty central one, which is fairness. So what we want to say is that you, you need to understand some things here in order to really think about fairness. This is not something that you're going to get a good grip on and you're, you're all set for life in the same way that like you learn to add fractions and then you're, you're good to go on that. It's, it's subtle, it's difficult, it, it mutates over time, the, the things that you need to be thinking about. You have to always be vigilant and just saying, well, I'm going to not be evil, that doesn't accomplish really much at all. The, the, the ways that you're likely to have opportunities to do harmful things aren't going to man manifest as some you know, nefarious, awful decision that you have to back away from. It's going to seem very mundane, and you, it, it will be very easy for you to sort of stumble into some harmful activity. So let, let's take a, a closer look at this, and we're going to take it sort of one step at a time. So it's going to start out pretty easy, and then the subtlety will, will kind of ramp up on us. To, to pick up on one of the examples that was shared earlier, and I mentioned it in my answer too, so think about a credit score model, which is trained on a person's credit history. 
and several pieces of demographic information about that person. And when you inspect the results of the model, you find that it's using the race attribute in a way that leads to low credit scores for some individual in, in a particular racial group, even if they have a strong credit history. So the, all their other metrics are good and they, in principle, should have a strong, strong credit score. But because the model has figured out that it wants to use the race variable to lower credit scores, it's going to impact those people negatively. So probably easiest question of, of the whole summer, but so just, but just try to elaborate. Why do you consider this undesirable? Any model that uses a person's race or ethnicity to affect scores is unfair. I agree with that. I think we would all agree with that. I want to start here because I want to highlight how we'll need to move beyond this, but this is an important starting point. Yeah, just, you know, kind of restating it, discriminating against a person purely on the basis of an immutable characteristic is one of the things that we don't really disagree about. And it might sort of feel like that's the end of the story. Like, okay, well, we didn't really need to get into ethics and like all the details of sort of different angles on ethics to, to arrive at a consensus conclusion here. And maybe we can just kind of do this all the time. We just agree on the things that are obviously unfair and we avoid those things. But in fact, there are lots of manifestations of this where there is going to be disagreement in the, in the ethical side of the question. And as a result, it is really helpful to kind of take a step back and develop some vocabulary and some historical perspective on the kind of different schools of thought about the way folks process ethical questions and this is going to be something that you do in data 2080. You'll take, take a step back from the data stuff and, and really kind of lay down some foundations for ethics. And that will show up when you start talking about questions that are a little more subtle. Just to, to kind of take, take another small step in this direction, I'll ask, what, what are some of the reasons why a model like the one that we've described so far that is using the race variable in a negative way and and maybe everyone would agree this is unacceptable. We don't want to be deploying a model that does this. Sometimes models that do really bad things make it in production, even though the people deploying them don't, don't want that. What are some reasons why that might be the case? Cool. So yeah, let's hear from Hardy on this one. Right. Yeah, that's exactly what I had in mind here. So Yash also answered along very similar lines. Yes, yeah, so this is what I have prepared too. So the, the, the real issue is they might not be checking. So, you know, as Hardy says, you, you are in an environment where you're trying to deploy a model quickly and, you know, get something that works, get it out there. And you might not feel like you just kind of have the bandwidth to check like, okay, what kind of impact is this model having? Let me inspect to see if there are, are some results here in the way this model behaves on the training set or on the test set that would indicate that it is it has a disparate impact in some way. So that just illustrates the importance of just paying attention to these things. You need to be aware of them. It already is kind of hinting at why it's important not to just sort of avoid making obviously, obviously nefarious decisions. Sometimes you're just training a model, you're like, hey, it looks pretty good, let's roll it out. And you're not looking at how it's going to impact people. And, and then all of a sudden, someone else notices that, they come back at you and they say, look, you know, you messed this up. But in any case, the point is, if, you, if you're checking for these things, that's a big difference between that and not checking. So, okay, so keep in mind that the, the setup here, the thing that we're describing hypothetically is a credit score model, which is trained on each person's credit history and a bunch of demographic information, including a race attribute. And it is using that data about race to negatively impact individuals in a particular racial group. So there's, I think, one sort of most obvious solution here, which would be what? Okay, so uh, yeah, folks really converged on the, the same answer that I had in mind when I prepared the question, which is drop the race attribute. You, you, you're having, you have this model, which is looking at some data that you don't want it to look at, and it's using it in a, in a deleterious way, and you want to avoid that, so you take that variable out of the data set. Indeed, this is a, a made-up example so far because, according to the Equal Credit Opportunity Act of 1974, you can't 
put variables like race into models that are making decisions about uh, credit worthiness or scoring systems that indicate credit worthiness. So th this particular problem is a little bit made up. Back in, before 1974, people used the race attribute on purpose to make harmful decisions. And since then, they've had to take that out. And of course, nowadays, no, no sane person would consider putting a race attribute into it, into a predictive model to produce something like a credit score. So this particular failure mode is pretty well averted, at least for this kind of a problem currently. And it might sort of seem, you know, we're taking kind of one small step at a time. It might sort of seem like, well, now, now we solved the problem. This was easy. I don't need a course to figure out, don't use a race variable if you don't want the model to use that information. However, as we've been saying, it's more subtle than that. It's gonna be tricky to really take this directive seriously. So I want you to reflect on that for a minute. What are some reasons why simply removing the race information from the data set might not be adequate? So I think we haven't heard from, from Katie yet. Yeah, that, that's a great point, the, this last thing that you mentioned. If you include the race variable in the data set, then you can look at how the model is interacting with that variable in a, a pretty straightforward way, at least for simple enough models. And even for more advanced models, there are still techniques to just study and aggregate how the different groups kind of shake out when you, you know, actually perform the prediction. But if you don't have access to the race variable at all, so you, know, you might imagine you have access to the race variable, but you take it out when you train the model. You might also imagine that someone has said, well, look, race is not relevant. I'm just going to, we're not going to collect that data, or we're going to take it out at some early stages before you get to it. Then you're a little bit in trouble at that point, because if there are racial biases in the data, you're not going to have a way to inspect that really. That's a great point. So yeah, just to kind of summarize what, what everybody shared here, even if the credit score is based on some information minus the race variable, even take away all the demographic variables, it's still possible that the model could essentially recreate that variable and then use it to make predictions. So in, implicitly, of course, it's not a model is not a conscious thing, but implicitly it could be effectively doing that. And such a model might be as unfair as the first one. And I wanna give one specific example about how that can happen so that you have sort of a concrete idea to go to when you're when you're contemplating this phenomenon. Think about how credit scores interact with housing. So on time mortgage payments boost your credit score because you're paying back a debt. And rent payments may not. So historically they they didn't and then you know advocates kind of recognize this issue and now to, to some extent in, in some situations they might be, but in general there's still a gap between mortgage payments impact on your credit score and rent payments. So if there are disparities in access to home loans, therefore introducing disparities in who's a homeowner versus who's renting, that can lead to credit score disparities. And differential access to home loans is a reality in the United States. So as I'm sure folks probably know, but just to rehash it, redlining refers to a, a practice endorsed by the government where there was a, a property rating system which designated neighborhoods with Black residents as hazardous to lenders. And as it has been well documented and elaborated at length, this exacerbated racial segregations in city neighborhoods and has effects on housing that, that continue to this day. So by virtue of favoring mortgage payments over rental payments, a credit rating model can discriminate against African-Americans in aggregate. To kind of highlight some important takeaways from this example, for one thing, unjust data practices can lead to self-perpetuating feedback loops. So for example, loan decisions are based on credit scores and credit scores are based on prior loan decisions by virtue of the way that mortgage rent payments are accounted for. And it follows that if you have an inequity in that process at any point in time, then the process is going to naturally exacerbate that inequity over time. So you have to have some, some effort counteracting that to, to try to minimize it, or else it's just going to spiral out of control. So that's a dynamic you have to be aware of. Even when, you know, after, after some point in time, the original injustice has been rectified, and now you're sort of in principle just building models that, that are basing their decisions on data that 
in principle you should be able to use, still you can have this aggregated exacerbation of the problem. And another important point to bear in mind is that models can be very good at extracting information that they can use to make their predictive accuracy higher. So that's the point of models. We want models that are very effective at producing very valuable, you know, accurate predictions. So we select models that are very good at this. And, and as a, as a sort of direct consequence, they're going to be good at extracting information in an indirect way that they can use. So they'll, they're trying to pull signal out of the data so that they can use it to make accurate predictions. And in many cases, in so doing, they're going to pick up on stuff that you really don't want them to pick up on for fairness reasons. So there is a fundamental tension here. It's not as simple as, well, let's just make our models fair. What's the big deal? There's a fundamental tension between trying to produce a, a very accurate, highly predictive model and trying to produce a model that is, is deliberately insensitive to certain signals that you want to be protected. Just to uh, kind of briefly sidestep this discussion and, and introduce a, an idea that I really want to have emphasized before you know, we go into the new school year. So when we have conversations with our partners in industry and academia and government, one of the, the themes that kind of emerges in those conversations is that organizations are increasingly seeing the light, so to speak. They're becoming convinced that it's in their interest to hire data scientists who are, are ethics conscious. And I want you to reflect for a minute on why that might be the case. So there are some other solutions people have tried in the past that, that are not that effective, like isolating the work of data responsibility within a team that's dedicated to that purpose and letting other data scientists just kind of ignore it while they're doing their part, or just hiring people who don't care about ethics in the first place and seeing what happens. So what are some reasons why those approaches might not be something that, that companies continue to be comfortable with? So several really nice answers here. I think we haven't heard from Yash in a while. Yash is, is focusing here on reputational risks. So you want to elaborate on this, Yash? Yeah, that's great. So yeah, so that it's a it's a positive thing about the social dynamics that exist in the 21st century where when businesses are guilty of unjust practices, that's something that can get picked up on social media and and really inflict a reputational cost to the company. So we're sort of aligning incentives, like ideally everyone would care about fairness and equity and self-motivate to do what they can to, to mitigate their harms. But in reality, those incentives need to be aligned through as many mechanisms as possible. And reputational capital is certainly one of them. So that's a, that's a good point. And that's certainly something that people are, are very conscious of because you know, reputation has a lot of inertia. It's very hard to, to sort of claw back your reputational black eyes that you've experienced over the years. Like, you know, this is something that companies are very sensitive to and, and rightfully so. There's some, some other angles here. So Katie, do you want to talk about your answer? Right. Yeah, that, that's great. So uh, also Hardy picked up on that thread as well in his answer. So the, the idea of kind of like isolating a team or, or kind of dealing with those concerns in some sandbox, it doesn't really comport with the reality of how fairness intersects with the, the work of data science. You have to be thinking about it when you're cleaning data, when you're training models, when you're validating models, when you're writing up your report, there's sort of, it's a, there's a ubiquitous element to the, the ethical considerations that doesn't really factor out very well. So yeah, so I'll just share the answers that, that I prepared, which very much go along the same lines. So ignoring ethical considerations completely is likely to lead to bad outcomes. I think that's pretty straightforward. Isolating the work in a, in a sort of data responsibility team has a lot of challenges. So there's the, the dynamic that Katie mentioned, but also if, if you've been in the corporate world, you, you know that there's some tension, for example, between HR and, you know, other sort of like maybe the salespeople, like think parts of the organization that are trying to optimize performance metrics versus parts of the organization that are trying to ensure compliance, like legal compliance, for example, or, you know, appropriate accommodation for needs of the employees. There's often tension there where, you know, HR sets up rules and then other people sort of try to subvert those rules. And it's not great. It's better if you can hire people who 
who have that orientation already in mind coming into the job. And then, yeah, this last one I had here is basically just f following Katie's comment about it. it. It doesn't really make sense to try to disentangle considerations of data science ethics from the, the process of doing data science. So yeah, so let's get back to the discussion of fairness. A few people were giving answers earlier when, when I was trying to sort of keep it super basic. They were giving more advanced, sophisticated answers that are that are sort of pointing in the direction of where we're going now. I want to I want to get into that because it is it is important to to kind of look at this with a, a little higher resolution than we've done so far. We, we talked about credit scoring earlier, and th this is, you know, something that's gotten a lot of attention. It's certainly an example where unfair practices have prevailed in the past. And the, the problem, I want you to decide between these two issues with the sort of hypothetical and, and even the real credit score model that we looked at earlier. Is the problem that the model doesn't match reality? Or is the problem that the model may match reality as well as it could given its data, but it's still problematic because it reflects and perpetuates past injustices. This is a really important idea. So we started by saying, well, take out the, the race attribute if you don't want it to use race. And then we're like, well, it might sort of recreate race in some way in, in order to, to sort of, you know, be more predictive and accurate and we want to kind of stop it from doing that. But now we should zoom in that on that a little bit more. So if if it's true that the the model is doing its best with the data it's ha it has in order to make accurate predictions, then what really is the problem and, and how can we make this trade-off in a meaningful way? We're, we're basically saying we're going to have to make a trade-off where we're making less accurate predictions in order to accomplish certain objectives that we have. So how does that come about? How is it embedded in the data in some way? And what can we do to mitigate that? So just kind of succinctly summarizing this idea, yesterday's data will not point the way towards a better tomorrow. So if you want a future that's different from the past, you're not going to get there just by building models that reproduce the phenomena of the past. And we're actually going to run some, some code here in a minute. So just go ahead and kick off your Python session. Um, what we're going to look at is an example that folks might have seen before. So this was in the news pretty big in 2016 it, because of a ProPublica report. So just to take a step back, so Compass is commercial software designed to predict recidivism, which is the likelihood that a person who's convicted of a crime will reoffend. So this is a very easy thing to measure when when people get out of prison or you know evade a prison sentence after committing a crime. We can assess are they later convicted of committing that crime again, and you want to know some information about that. If someone's very likely to commit a crime again, then that would weigh in the decision of how sentencing is done. And Compass is important because it's actually used in decision-making processes in courts in the United States. So it's not just some random model, someone trained and we're looking at it. This is actually used and deployed in American courts today. And in 2016, ProPublica did some analysis of, of Compass's data, and they found that there's some racial disparities in the predictions made by this model. So if you, if you look at the event that a defendant is observed later not to reoffend, so you look at the people who, in fact, are safe, they're going to go back out in the world, they're not going to reoffend based on actual observation of what happened. Then the model scores the defendants who are black as higher risk than the defendants who are white, even among people who are definitely not going to reoffend because you're two years later, you've already observed, did they reoffend and they didn't. On the flip side, if you look at people who do end up reoffending, then condition on being in that set, if you're white, you're likely to be rated as the model as lower risk. And if you're black, you're likely to be rated as that uh, by the model as higher risk. And this happens despite, of course, the model not using race as a variable. So the model is somehow introducing these disparities in a, in a systematic way without using race as a variable. And you would think like, surely that's because the model is really sophisticated and it's somehow extracting the data that it does have access to 
to reproduce the race variable and we need to kind of get in there and stop that. And as we're going to see, that's not really the case. The problem is, is deeper than that. The problem is more fundamental. We'll develop that idea next time, but I'll just use the last minute here to, to ask sort of a basic question about this model. So does the model satisfy the equal treatment notion of fairness? In other words, if we imagine we have a defendant and we leave every other variable about that defendant the same, and we just flip the race variable, does the model's output stay the same, yes or no? So the correct answer here is yes, and it's just, it's just a matter of definition. So if the model does not use race as a variable, and then all you change is the race variable, then the model is seeing exactly the same input. So the model is definitely producing the same output if you only change the race variable, just by definition. If it changed based on changing the race variable, then it is using the race variable. So this is why the, the folks who make Compass would be able to come back and say, well, you know, this is fair in the sense that if, if a person has exactly the same data other than their race and you flip the race, then it's fine, like nothing changes. That's true, but it's not the end of the story. And I'll, I'll just send one final message here to pull the data set in so you can look at this data set if you want to before next time. So this is pandas code. We haven't talked about pandas at all. This is something you'll learn all about in data 1030. But the point for now is just to pull in this data. So we're getting this data from GitHub, from ProPublica. And what you can see is if you split the, the data frame up by the two-year recidivism, like zero didn't reoffend, one did reoffend, and you look at the model risk here, then you're going to find very significant differences in the groups. So a black defendant who is not going to reoffend has a 33% chance of being labeled high risk by the model, and for a white defendant, it's only 15%. So that's a huge difference, more than a factor of two. If you're not going to reoffend, and like, what's your score going to be? For a white defendant, your score is going to be much lower on average. And in the other way, there's also almost a factor of two. If you're white and you are going to reoffend, you still have a 60% chance of the model saying, yeah, this person is low risk. And for a black defendant, it's drastically lower, only 37%. So if you're used to looking at statistics, these are huge differences. And we're going to really need to kind of drill down to try to figure out what's going on here. And it turns out we can get a really kind of satisfying handle on the nature of the problem. It's not sort of obscured by the complexity of the model. We can see it even for really basic models. We'll roll that out next time.